It is the middle ground between light and shadow, between science and superstition, and it lies between the pit of man's fears and the summit of his knowledge. This is Time Enough Podcast. Hey, it's the Time Enough podcast where we are ripping through the entirety of the Twilight Zone and beyond. This is Matt here. Uh, today we have a man who's written books that definitely jump into the Twilight Zone with uh, transhumanism, Nephilim, all of that. Hello, Kenami. Thanks for joining. Hello, and thanks for having me. Uh, looking forward to this one. I'm glad you mentioned it because I had definitely not seen this one before. Yeah, I've um, said on the, this podcast before, I basically had like a brick of discs of The Twilight Zone, about a third of the show. So this is one I don't think I had seen until uh, pretty recently. But uh, yeah, yeah, this is a pretty solid one, I think. So um, just to start off, I will run through a bit of trivia on this episode, give it its uh, deets or whatever. So this was actually the first production run episode of The Twilight Zone. Uh, since Where Is Everyone, Everybody, the first episode was filmed on a borrowed Universal sound stages. They filmed this in the sweltering heat of Death Valley, and those hardy folks had to take over production duties from those fainting in the heat. So you'd have, like, the, uh, the director of photography, like, doing lighting and stuff. Um, <laughs> the lesson learned, scenes inside the metal shack were relocated to a Hollywood sound stage where only the lights amped up the heat. Uh, Jack Warden plays Corey. He was a television regular by 1959, but really made his mark playing alongside Warren Beatty in 1975's Shampoo and 1978's Heaven Can Wait, both of which honored him with Best Supporting Actor nominations. John Denner, here as Allenby, had a long career in TV and film westerns, often playing shady authority figures. He was a voice of Paladin in the radio version of Have Gun, Will Travel, and dabbled in animation as well. Ted Knight doesn't make much of a mark in this episode as one of Allenby's men, but he certainly did as doltish anchorman Ted Baxter on the Mary Tyler Moore show. Uh, he also appeared in the feature film comedy Caddyshack. Jean Marsh as Alicia is fantastic here, but her headline credit is probably as a creator and actor in the BBC series Upstairs Downstairs. Most of her credits do revolve around British television, but she also showed up in films such as the Hollywood fiasco Cleopatra. Director John Jack Smite's career was somewhat compact, but he directed some notable movies, such as The Illustrated Man, Airport, 1975, and Midway. <sighs> Sorry, there was a lot on this one. A lot of uh, pretty notable people doing things here, I guess. So, <laughs> And uh, Ken, I'm going to give you your, your role here. If you would uh, give us the prologue for this particular episode. Yes, I will. Witness, if you will, a dungeon made of mountains, salt flats, and sand that stretches to infinity, infinity, infinity. Actually, I have a, in fact, I should have done that. Stretches to infinity. All right. Okay. The dungeon has an inmate, James A. Corey. And this is his residence, a metal shack, an old touring car that squats in the sun and goes nowhere, or there's nowhere to go. For the record, let it be known that James A. Corey is a convicted criminal placed in solitary confinement. Confinement, in this case, stretches as far as the eye can see, because this particular dungeon is on an asteroid nine million miles from Earth. Now witness, if you will, a man's mind and body shriveling in the sun. A man dying of loneliness. Rocking effects there. <laughs> but um, so this was, uh, are you someone that had seen much of the Twilight Zone in general, just out of curiosity? No, I must say not. No, not really. Yeah, I mean, and the point of this podcast is to bring people very familiar and to kind of uh, give some fresh eyes on it. Um, you and I, you know, about a year ago, we talked about the uh, creation of the humanoids. And I felt like this 
film or well, the short, this TV episode sort of dovetails with those ideas a bit. We talked a lot about the um, how how the sister of the guy who turns out to be a humanoid had um, you know fallen in love with her her robot or her humanoid basically. So, so right. sort of similar vibes here. <laughs> Yes, but I, indeed. And so the premise, of course, is that he's in, in about as much solitary confinement as he can get, because he literally doesn't even get one hour of rec time. Just <laughs> he's on an asteroid in the middle of nowhere and just gets occasional visits from a crew that brings him supplies. And that's about it. So like um, when he begins narrating, he says six month year four and all the days and months and the years are the same you know and it's just driving them insane to, to be there and be alone and kind of be in this very hot environment so that he doesn't even bother driving that car around even where he could right because what's the point point? you go from a hot metal shack to a hot metal car to not really go anywhere <laughs> Well, I guess you uh, get the wind in your hair a little bit, maybe. But uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, hot wind. But that is the basically the the first machine he uh, quote unquote falls in love with. I guess he's you know he obsessively works on the car. Okay, so yes, if you didn't hit upon that, I was going to because if I think we should work our way towards the juxtaposition between the car and the robot. Robot, you know, back in those days, they didn't really pronounce it robot. It was like. Oh, robot. Yeah. I, th I think yeah, even in my notes, like I wrote robot. out robot. They, they just kind of, yeah, they just kind of mashed the, I don't know, it's like a, a a shortened version where they weren't sure how to pronounce every single letter or something. I don't know. Yeah. And then you got uh, Captain Kirk uh, doing the robot and um, his, what's the other one? He does a sabotage, I think. There's a few times he's saying sabotage. Maybe it's a Canadian thing. I don't know. But he's like sabotage. So. <laughs> So you know. there's one scene where he states that, uh, and this was very emotive for me, uh, the inside of my mouth feels like gunpowder and burnt copper. That's how I woke up this morning. <laughs> <laughs> and then he says, deep down inside my gut, uh, deep down inside my gut, I get an ache that's just pulling everything out. Then I force myself to hold on for one more day, just one more day. But I can't do that for um, another year. I'll go right out of my mind, right? Yeah. So he's a yeah he's a convicted criminal, and he's hoping for a pardon. But any every time that ship comes to deliver supplies, the bad news is nope. You got to do more time and more time and more time. And we'll we'll play one move on the chessboard, and we're gone in fifteen minutes. <laughs> yeah, there you go. If even that. So you know, I'm I, I'm. On kind of wondering like what's worse this giant expansive version of solitary confinement he's got wide open skies wide open desert and you know or you know a, a cell <laughs> with the normal solitary confinement which um right. allenby the captain does say like you know we're just delivering supplies i think this is horrible so right allenby empathizes with it. in fact let's jump into something that i found very technically accurate and I was glad that it happened. And that's the issue of ethics because at one point he tells Allenby, I'm not a murderer. I killed in self-defense. And that's actually the ethically the correct terminology to use. So he's denying that he murdered anybody murder being the unjustified taking of an innocent human life whereas he said i killed in self-defense well that makes sense because killing is a justified taking of a human life in cases such as self-defense so that was very technically accurate terminology he's denying being a murderer he's just admitting to being a killer and that he had to in self-defense and alan b believes him by the way yeah, Alan yeah. B understands that. Yeah, I mean, it could have and been he, a big case on Earth. We don't know, right? Because yeah, Alan B um, makes it sound as if it's sort of known. It's not just that he personally believes him because he likes the guy. He speaks as if 
okay, yeah, we understand. We on earth, some of us understand that that was the case. You didn't murder, you killed, and it was self-defense. So that kind of makes you empathetic for when the show starts, it's like, oh, this criminal's in solitary confinement, too bad for him. But then you get to learn that, okay, wait a minute, maybe he doesn't actually belong there. And so that's part of the, uh, the um, conflict, the inner conflict of the viewer saying, should, should I feel for this guy or not? When I was younger, um, you know, it would have annoyed me that we don't know anything about what's going on on earth, if it's a futuristic society, you know, uh, being a little older, uh, I now appreciate sort of uh, that subtle brush, you know, like we don't need to know anything about earth. We just, it's just a situation, you know, it, it, the sci-fi details aren't as important as like you said, the ethics and uh, the transhumanism, I guess we're going to get to in a few minutes. <laughs> yes. So the, the rub really the and it's kind of an interesting how these episodes were so short so they kind of jam packed them with virtually no uh fluff or puff it's just uh every sentence was supposed to convey something meaningful right so we find out every few months he says it's about every three months uh this supply ship would come and sometimes alan b would be able to play some board games with him or whatever cards uh, but then he would bring him things like paperback books or what have you. Well, this time around, he drops off this large crate, right? Wait, of and, course. Yeah, and the crew doesn't know what it is. Alan B. does. His two-man crew doesn't know. They just know it's a large crate, and they leave it in front of the shack, and then they, <laughs> they take off, and he opens it, and what do we find within? What's in Wait, the box? Yeah. What's in the box? <laughs> We get a uh, yeah, we get a shocking face from uh, from you know from Corey, <laughs> and then we cut to uh, Alicia uh, right. now you know out in the sun, fully functioning, I suppose. <laughs> so let me read uh, a little bit of the dialogue here. So Alan B says, "We'll be back in three months." Look, when you open up that crate, there's nothing you need to do. The item's been vacuum packed. You'll need no activator of any kind. The air will do that. And then he's actually asked, Captain, what's in that big crate, huh? One of his crewmen asked him that. And his reply is so incredibly cryptic. I'm not quite sure, really. Uh, maybe it's an illusion. Maybe it's salvation. I don't know. Right? Yeah. So yeah, it's super cryptic to the point where he's not really sure what he's accomplished in bringing this crate with a robot in it. And he uh, makes it clear that he could get fired back on Earth for doing that. But that's how much he's um, kind of befriended Corey. And then uh, Corey reads the owner's manual. You are now the proud possessor of a robot built in the form of a woman. To all intents and purposes, the creature is a woman. Psychologically and um, physiologically, she is a human being with a set of emotions. All right, that's unique. Uh, and a memory track with the ability to reason, to think, and to speak. She is beyond illness and under normal circumstances should have a lifespan similar to the, that of a normal human being. Her name is Alicia. And it's, I guess she replaces the car, you know, if, if only we all got um, owner's manuals with our significant others. <laughs> <laughs> now, well, one thing is the first thing she does is say, my name is Alicia. What's your name? And he's, he says, get out of here, get out of here. I don't need no machine. Go on, get out of here. And she says, my name is Alicia. What is your name? Now, my sense of humor would have been that when she said, my name is Alicia, what's your name the first time? And he replied, get out of here, get out of here. She should have said, well, nice to meet you. Get out of here. <laughs> That's an unusual <laughs> name for a human, but I'm pleased to meet you. Right on. Back in <laughs> so the right dad territory. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, like I tell my kids, I'm a dad, not a comedian. Well, my, my um, daughter apparently thinks some of my jokes are smart, so good for me, I guess. Oh, <laughs> bravo. But English is not her first language either, so. <laughs> ah, well, she'll learn then. She'll learn. Right. I, but so right away, he's standoffish. He's a machine. And um, at when he becomes more and more conflicted, he says, why didn't they build you to look like a machine? Why didn't they build you out of metal with bolts and wires and electrodes and things like that? Why'd they turn you into a lie? 
right? Yeah. I'll cover you with something that looks like flesh, give you a face, a face that if I, if I look long enough, it makes me think, makes me believe that it's a lie. You mock me. You know that when you look at me, when you talk to me, I'm being mocked, right? So he's taken aback that he finally has a companion and he wants to keep seeing her as nothing but a machine. But then, of course, the uh, allure of the aesthetics, she looks exactly like a woman and acts like one too in terms of that she's able to feel what they call emotions. Uh, um, and the turning point is when she dies and he sees the tears and he touches them with his fingers and he, okay, yeah, that totally um, changes his mind about her or it. And being in solitary confinement, he's, I mean, that's the thing. He can like it or not like it. He is now going to be confronted with this um, machine. Right, right. <laughs> so. so he says uh, when, when she's implying that she's hurting him, uh, that, that he's hurting her, she says, how can I hurt you? This isn't real flesh. There aren't any nerves under there. There aren't any muscles or tendons. You're just like this heap. There you go, referring to the car. A hunk of metal with arms and legs instead of wheels. Um, but then yeah, he says, but this heap doesn't mock me the way you do. It doesn't look at me with make-believe eyes or talk to me with a make-believe voice. Well, I'm sick of being mocked by the memory of women. And that's all you are, a reminder to me that I'm so lonely, I'm about to lose my mind. About to. Right. I probably passed that already. But uh... <laughs> yeah, Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, but... par part of what... You know, I did a stint of watching certain uh, TV show series about prisons and what it's like in there, and also prisons from around the world, where some of them were just absolutely shocking. So, for instance, the outside of the prison was administered by the guards, but the inside was run by gangs. So the guards would just kind of come in there to verify a head count, and that was it. The rest of it was handled by uh, gangs in whatever country they might have been. And um, then there's the issue of the solitary confinement, part of which is that you are indeed in solitary confinement, part of which is just the expectation that it's not going to change tomorrow or the next week or the next month or the next year. And that's just part of what will drive somebody crazy, right? Yeah. About, I guess it was about 15 years ago, maybe a little less, uh, my, my wife had gotten into watching a prison break. And I think she watched the whole show, but I kind of stopped around season three because I was like, it was um, maybe it's Guatemalan prison or something. I was like, oh, this isn't realistic at all because it had that situation where, you know, the gangs are running the inside. And a few years later, it's like, oh, that was accurate. That's insane. <laughs> right, right. Or well, I watched one where I don't remember the numbers precisely, but it was something like a cell that had made for 24 inmates held over 100 and they were sitting on the floor cross-legged and it was almost like an optical illusion because there's a guy sitting here and a guy sitting here and one here and one in front and one in back and one on this side this side this side and this side just like a row and a row and another row like they had barely inches to themselves if that it's just like i said an optical illusion like it was fake but it's just all these guys crammed into one little cell yeah, I visited um, Hokkaido, the northern island of Japan, a few years ago, and um, they have an open-air museum of an old prison uh, mm. that they had built, I guess, in the 1880s or something. But, you know, Japanese have the onsens, the, the baths, right? And there was, like, this prison onsen where the prisoners would get in line, go in one tub, wash in mm. a certain way. For, they get five minutes, and they go, everyone moves, like, an assembly line. So kind of, kind of that sort of thing uh, in play there as well. But... <laughs> So without changing the water in between inmates, I would imagine. No, well, yeah, you're supposed to, to wash completely before you get in, submerge yourself. Oh. You're already supposed to be clean. That's how it works in Japan. So, uh, okay. you know, I always make sure to make, if I'm at one of these places, I make a show like, hey, everybody, I'm washing myself. I'm not a stupid American. <laughs> so it's like a mineral bath or just something that's supposed to be like uh, therapeutic. Right, right, like, you know, lots okay. of volcanic activities, so Actually, the, the oh, best yes, ones yes, yes. Uh, have that kind of water. Um, yeah. Of course, uh, getting back to, to this show, he doesn't, yes. this, there's certainly no water in, a, in this land, <laughs> except for, I, I did find it amazing that they 
start they actually did start to try and film in a metal shack in death valley before realizing that was a terrible idea and going back to the studio yeah you're <laughs> filming it, inside an oven basically yeah it truly does look super hot in this episode yeah. i mean there's you know that's something that comes across really well even and, allenby goes into the shack and uses some of the water to to kind of refresh himself and he's only been out of the spaceship like five minutes yeah, so I, I don't know if he had an air conditioner. I guess he didn't. They are just like, live in your shack. <laughs> yeah, that, that was pretty much it. Well, he does get nighttime, and I, I felt like that's more so than the, uh, you know, you're hurting me, she's crying. You know, the, the staring at the stars seems to be the uh, sort of, I guess, the, the deepest scene. That's where Corey is finally, or not finally, but just completely relating to her as a yes. person now. right. And um, they're looking at stars and constellations. He's pointing out different ones. And she says, God's beauty. And he says, that's right, Alicia, God's beauty. So it was kind of interesting to throw in a little theology in there, which, you know, I would imagine back then in American culture, that would have just been a normal thing. People would expect to say something like that, where today you'd be some kind of cancel for saying something as innocent as well we're reflecting on god's beauty but it's interesting that the robot is the one who brings that up yeah yeah so you know that <laughs> the opposite of dating the line i suppose <laughs> deepening the line i guess is what we want to go right. with but um so yeah by then there he's totally given over to this relationship with her and um he says this is a very strange and bizarre relationship is it man or and woman or man and machine, I don't really know myself, but there are times when I do know that Alicia is simply an extension of me. And uh, that's interesting in terms of programming a robot and also an actual human relationship. Um, I hear my words coming from her, my emotions, the things that she has learned to love are those things that I've loved. I'm not lonely anymore. Each day now can be lived with, um, and I love Alicia. Nothing else matters. Which, so what um, I mean by programming is that, so for example, she obviously would have programmed, been programmed to sort of uh, input data coming off of him and then spit it back at him in just a crude way of stating it, right? So that yeah. she's like, is this this feedback uh, mechanism where she's going to reflect him because that'll make him more comfortable in the relationship that she likes the things, same things she does and so on. But then that's also reality. Of course, we get right? the, most, the much less romantic view of it these days as we wake up, look at our phone and we have, you know, emails trying to sell us things that we just happened to say to somebody else yesterday. True that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's sad and true, yes. Uh, you know, the but Alicia so is the much more romanticized version of that. <laughs> and, you know, considering how quickly they went, and maybe one single scene took us from him being completely standoffish. I guess there were three scenes that are momentous in the relationship. One is he's completely standoffish, calling her nothing but a robot. The second one where she's telling him that she is being hurt by him. And then the third one where they're just completely into each other and just enjoying life. Yeah. And I, before that, there's a few moments of them basically playing house. Um, like, like you said, with Alicia's greeting, she is totally robotic when she comes out of the box, right? Yeah. Or literally out of the My box. My name is her. Alicia. What's your name? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Is it Jean Marsh is the actor? yeah so yeah she was extremely good because you know she could have just gone through the whole thing robotic i suppose but becomes a, a pun intended fleshed out character um and then we i guess we have to get to the uh, unfortunate conclusion of the of the whole situation <laughs> where uh yeah, well yes um maybe let's talk about the car a little bit more because the cars are you know, cool. the, the, the conclusion is just i don't know it's there's a lot to it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's so, pretty yeah, I'm glad you picked up on, on the car because to me that was the juxtaposition is that he has this car. He, it had been brought to him in pieces and he put it together. So it's like his own accomplishment. 
And he was actually quite pleased about the amount of time it took him. It took him a year to put it together. He was uh, thankful for that because obviously that was a year of him just having busy time, right? He had something to do. And so he put this car together, but then he doesn't even bother using it because he says, well, okay, well, now he's done with the car, but there's nowhere to go. So it's like really futile after the time he invested in it, which would take his mind away from his loneliness and the uh, repetitiveness of doing nothing. Well, now he had this metallic device there that was just useless to, to him. And that's why he juxtaposes it with her. He's like, you know, you're like this car. You got arms instead of wheels though, like big deal. You're just like this. And so uh, the narration had said the old touring car that squats in the sun and goes nowhere for there's nowhere to go. And then he says that the supply ship Captain Allenby brought it in parts for that antique automobile. I was a year in putting that thing together such as it is, a whole year putting um, an old car together, but thank God for that car and for the hours, the hours I used up and the days and the weeks. And then he says, I can look out at it. Uh, I can look at it. I know it's real. Okay, sorry. Um, I can look at it out there and I know that it's real. Reality is what I need. That's what he said. And so the thing is, he put this thing together and he was grateful for what it was, but then kind of realized there's nothing to this immobile thing. But this is, um, reality is what he needs, but this is kind of like a simulacrum of reality. It's, it's not an organic reality. That's what he really wanted, but he wasn't getting that from this car. And well, he really wasn't getting that from Alicia either, except she was a simulacrum, a simulation of, of organic reality. And then that just become, became good enough for him because the poor guy, what, what else could he do, right? Yeah. I, the he way I think he had companionship. He kind of put yeah. his, his, you know, he poured himself into the car, basically. Like that was his point of passion, but he didn't really get anything back from it, right? He didn't even take it for a drive in the end, whereas... Right. Alicia, at, despite being a, you know, a simulation, is giving something back, letting him interact, which is, mm. you know, other than just with cold machinery, even though she is still just cold machinery inside, yeah. I suppose. <laughs> so that seemed like kind of a difference. I, I guess the question I would pose to you is, can we put a ghost into a machine? <laughs> Is it possible to have an AI that has full consciousness or is it always that humanoid 99%, you know? Well, or how could we really know if a machine or let's say an AI became what's called strong um, or general AI? Uh, if it reached that self-consciousness, um, would we really? even know and i mean i understand there's uh, forms of the turing test but uh me boy you know you know you talk to some human beings today and you could swear <laughs> you could swear that they're just half programmed robots you know <laughs> and come on you i'm sure you've had experiences in your life and i have where you become a half programmed robot for a while you're driving down the street and you're like whoa five minutes are gone what where yeah. was i you know yeah. i was but, not present then <laughs> But I think that when you ask if we could put a ghost in the machine, that's it's. So in this case, Corey did put a ghost in the machine, not the programmers, because she came ready made, but he put the ghost in the machine in a manner of speaking because he put himself into her, right? He gave that organic life to something that was inorganic. So in other words, he is the one really who made the choice to turn her into a partner and somebody and something that he could love. So in a way he did that. And that's kind of like what we're facing if uh, transhumanism turns out the way that it's uh, being proposed to us, that there will be very human-like machines, whether they're strictly, um, software or whether they're built into androids let's go beyond robot 
because she's really a, in today's terminology, she'd be called an android, like a, like a robot that looks like a human. And then, so would a relationship with a thing that was constructed like that be an actual relationship? I mean, these are very difficult and complicated existential and ethical questions that we're going to have to deal with pretty soon, most likely. So for instance, when he's telling her uh, that she's made of uh, um, gears and white, all this stuff, okay, but we're made of arteries and veins and, and muscle. And, and so it's, it's like, does a different substance make the being any less um, so what was really insightful in the way they conceived of this robot is that it was fully interactive, right? It, she has a memory. Um, she has the ability to feel. So this wasn't like many of the robots in the early sci-fi. They're but just basically walking boxes, you know. <laughs> they speak robotically, pun intended, and they move robotically. And they're just like uh, what they used to call garbage in, garbage out. So it's kind of interesting how they made this one um, something that could be a character on the show and that could very quickly be accepted as a person, whether she was an organic woman or not. You could accept her for what she was, which is a thinking, feeling, reactive, crying uh, thing. But yeah, and I guess the reason I was asking about the ghost in the machine is even with that, ultimately, I feel like she's sort of, you know, like the Velvet Underground song, I'll be your mirror, you know? <laughs> like all, all of the things that make her real are basically as as you mentioned coming from Corey. she's uh she's reflecting back the person he is accurate well not accurate right. but you know in high definition i guess we could say see this is part of what that why it's so fascinating that's why i was saying that like in a real life relationship between two humans there is some of that you have to do some of that or else you're just going to be completely overbearing, right? Right. Right. So, for example, um, when I used to be single, a bachelor, oh, man, I thought I was the nicest guy around because, well, it was all about me. My schedule was mine. I didn't have to share my time with anybody unless I just happened to want to. But then when you get married, it's like, okay, now I'm seeing that. Um, it's more difficult for me to be uh, more open giving, more sacrificing. And then, then you have to develop a whole other part of your personality. And part of it is I'm going to do the things that please you. So part of the issue with her is that she may never have actually done anything that really challenged him in terms of um, doing her own thing, as they say. But then that also touches upon how today's culture is becoming more, more robotic in terms of that. I'm sure that there are plenty of people who would prefer that kind of relationship with a reactive being uh, entity that was programmed to just completely be a mirror. And that's what they would want. Why bother with all this uh, human conflict stuff? You know, just give me somebody who's going to just uh, be almost like a slave and that'll be good enough for them because after all when you're showing up on their feed on their little device and they don't like what you say they could just swipe you away and you're gone you're just you're not a real person you're just something that shows up along with a thousand other people on their little screen yeah i'll i'll, I'll date myself by putting myself in the dating scene back when we could have been walking around a borders bookstore but i was dating a girl and um nice but we go in there and she's just kind of following me around i'm looking at something i'm like don't don't you want to have something of your own to right, go right. do now <laughs> why well, you know it seemed kind of weird i thought you know you, you go in and you find your own interest and uh spend a few minutes with that but uh yeah but uh, again i guess they're trying to oh be interested in what i'm interested in so there's a certain amount where you know you, you don't want a mirror uh in solitary right. confinement i guess it's fine but um yes i i had a a friend who told me that story, uh, a story about when he got married and it was not working out very well because he said, well, one of the things that attracted me to her is she was so creative. She was a painter. She played music. She did this. She did that. And then we, we got married. It's like she just dropped all of that, all of those interests. But that's what made her interesting to him. But 
she dropped it off to just kind of, um, I'm not sure how to word it, but in other words, all those things that made her unique to him and attractive were pretty much gone because she just became a kind of um, more complacent to, well, whatever he wants to do, let's do that. And I'm gonna kind of stop my own thing. And I know I, I read this quotation every single time I talk about transhumanist issues, but he, uh, Isaac Asimov, and I've probably read it on your show before, but um, Isaac Asimov hit the, hit the nail on the head so well decades ago that I always read this. So he says, I wonder if we'll make robots so much like men and men so much like robots that eventually we'll lose the distinction altogether and have a combined culture. This may be best after all. Maybe humanity itself will die out as humanity and sort of melt into this machine culture. And so there you have it. I mean, human beings are becoming more robotic. Our AI is becoming more human. And so we're inevitably, we're going to meet somewhere. Yeah. Um, just, just to get to the end of this episode, though, of course, Corey's mirror gets uh, smashed, I guess. If we can run the metaphor that way. Yeah. And I have some quotations for, I could read if you want. Yeah. But maybe that's the way to uh, get back to that particular scene. What, what do you have? So towards the end, we have uh, Corey, who's been saved from his uh, desperate loneliness by falling in love with Alicia. And well, here comes uh, the spaceship with Alan B announcing to him that da, 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 you've been pardoned. And so we're here to take you back to Earth. But since um, the leadership of Earth is not only pardoning him, they're actually ceasing all such solitary confinements upon asteroids. <laughs> so they're bringing all the prisoners back to Earth. And so they're saying, we only have room for 15 pounds of stuff. And he says, all I have is a shirt, a ledger book, a pencil, and a pair of shoes, right? Like, and he says, the car, they can keep, right? That's, he, he barely has anything he, he needs to bring with him. And he says, Alicia and I will climb into that ship of yours. And then Alan B goes, oh, dear God, I forgot her, right? So one of the crewmen says, who's Alicia? And Alan B says, a robot. But Corey says, she's a woman. Corey, she's a robot. She's a woman. She's gentle and kind, Alan B. She kept me alive. Why, if it wasn't for her, I would have been finished. I would have give, given up. And so they have limited space in the craft. And they're letting him know it's basically just you and a couple of things. We can't be, um, we can't fit this robot in there. It's not just about fitting. It's about uh, the, the amount of weight. And so the amount of um, fuel they have left for liftoff and flight and all of this stuff, right? And Corey says, there'll be no more problems on heaven and earth. We'll just climb in that, that ship of yours. And then again, the, the, the conflict, leave that robot. She's not a robot. She's a woman. Um, you leave her behind. That's murder. So notice that now Corey is the one saying, if we leave her here, that's actually going to be an act of murder because you'll be leaving her alone and that she'll eventually just pass away as a, <laughs> as a robot might. And, and so Alan B. saying, I don't have any choice. I have no choice at all. And then what does he do? You want to tell the audience while I cry? Murder, but a, uh, yeah. a, a rather distinctive gunshot to the face where we do see- To the see, face of all things, yeah. We, we do see Alicia is but a bunch of gears uh, under that layer of skin. Yeah, so Alan B blows her metallic brains out. <laughs> you know, and the thing is the show had to conclude so quickly that I don't think they really, they could have given it a little more time for Corey to kind of have this emotional reaction and then come to his senses or whatever. But it was the end of the show and they just kind of, he instantly recognizes that, okay, she's gone and let's go. So Alan B tells him, it's all behind you now, Corey. It's all behind you. It's like a bad dream, a nightmare. When you wake up, you'll be back on earth. You'll be home. And you're leaving behind, um, all you're leaving behind is loneliness. And he just says, I must remember that. 
I must remember to keep that in mind. And that's really it. He's just kind of accepted the fact that, well, that's all folks, you know, where I thought if it would have been interesting, maybe nowadays with a little romanticism, they would have had him deny his exit. They would have, he would have told Alan B, you guys go and take off without me. I'm going to stay here and live with Alicia. You know, that, that could have been an option too, that he would have opted for or to live in this uh, illusion really, um, but that it was working for him so that he would have opted for her because in his mind, he was in love with a woman. Well, and again, he was, you know, he didn't commit murder. He just killed someone in self-defense. So we right. have at the end what he sees as a murder. Allenby doesn't. He sees it as, you know, just uh, getting distractions out of the way. But um, I, I guess with Corey, I didn't see it so much as him just suddenly changing his mind as basically being in a state of shock at that point. Just interacting at, you know, just like while freaking out inside is sort of how I read it. But uh, yeah, it is a shorthand, definitely. Yeah. In fact, uh, there's a movie called Solaris from 20, um, 2002. And it's based on a movie I believe was Russian. That's right. That yeah, was, we, oh, we almost yeah. did that last week, but I actually oh. ended up doing John Carter instead. <laughs> but see, what's interesting about Solaris, and I'm referring to, I mean, obviously, both movies have the same premise. It's just the Russian one's a little harder to follow, <laughs> obviously, uh, from 1972. So the 2002 version, the point is that he's uh, the... George Clooney character is out in, out in outer space and he ends up somehow encountering some sort of dimension type of thing where he ends up uh, with um, an illusion of his deceased wife, if I remember correctly. And the point of it is that in the end, he opts to live in that illusion because then at least he could be with her, even though it's not the actual organic her. Uh, just the idea of her interacting with him was enough so that he actually opts for that, for that, okay, I'll live, I know it's an elude, but to me it's real enough, and I'm opting to live that. I, I guess that sort of leads me to the couple of questions I like to, to ask at the end of these things. Um, so, so it's, Sometimes it seems like an easy question. Sometimes it turns out to have an interesting uh, dimension, right? Uh, the first being, in this episode, who took a trip through the twilight zone? So I think Corey, for sure. Um, Alan be sort of being a messenger, but not necessarily being the, there himself. But the, then the uh, big question I have here is Alicia. Yeah. <laughs> Did Alicia an, experience yeah. the twilight zone? Right. That would have been an interesting way to look at it. What if we were a world of robots and we're watching this episode, right? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, because then yeah, it's yeah. Her, her dark story, right? Right, and it would have been about how she got this human to change his mind and to treat her nicely and to fall in love with her. And yeah, it would be really uh, a whole different worldview, right, if you look at it from that perspective. Yeah, so... So that, yeah, for her, she fulfilled her purpose in life, really, which was, like you said, just to be a mirror, apparently. Um, but hey, that's what she was created for, and she fulfilled her purpose. Since I'm pretty sure we're both human, so I'll, I'll focus the next uh, question on uh, Corey being, do these people deserve their trips into the twilight zone? And uh, I don't know. I guess, you know, he's a kind of a gruff dude, but you can't help but feel a little sorry for the guy in the end. Well, because for one, it, it does turn out he was pardoned, so we will say that, yeah, okay, he was not a murderer. He killed in self-defense. So he's right to go back home now and be a free man. And, and he was uh, just suffering solitary confinement, really for no just reason. So yeah, th there's every reason to empathize with him because really in the end, he did nothing wrong. And uh, he fulfilled his loneliness by building a relationship with a machine, which as odd as it might be, especially back then, today it's like commonplace, you know, people spend more time staring at their little devices than um, maybe having a conversation nowadays, especially if you 
not just the hours in a day, but just like he says, <laughs> yeah, the, the years, right? The months, the weeks, the days. And then at the very end, the narration tells us um, the place he lived in and the machines he used, Mr. Corey's machines, including one made in his image, kept alive by love, but now obsolete in I mean, the twilight zone. All right. <laughs> I, gee, I could do that. I have a reverb pedal down here. Okay. <laughs> no, I just, I don't know why it was popping in my head. I was just thinking of the uh, Adams Family movie where it's like, he's a lady killer. Acquitted. <laughs> oh, right. Alan B is pretty, you know, to him, it's just, okay, so that's another interesting perspective. Let's talk about that for a second. To Alan B, this is a robot. He dropped it off in a box, immobile. He never interacted with it. All of a sudden, he shows up. He had, like, even forgotten about her. And incidentally, recall that the supply ships were to come every three months, but somehow Corey and Alicia were developing this relationship for 11 months and no, no interruption from the supply ship. So maybe they took longer because all the, these uh, political machinations were going on on Earth about the pardon so they had an extended time to do that and um so almost as long as he built the car he had a relationship with her but in alan b's mind it's like i dropped off an immobile robot now he's saying it's a woman we got to get out of here asap kaboom to him it's like nothing you know it's literally just a, a machine and and it was unuseful and it was getting in the way of uh, his mission so no thought just let's get rid of it kaboom over yeah uh you know since i do the sci-fi movies on the other show we we come to the conclusion that um in the star wars universe the the worth of a character depends on how nice or not they are to the droids <laughs> and, and also the worth is how much of them you can see i mean i remember watching the the original Star Wars, and you think the Imperial Stormtroopers are robots. And then later on, you end up, because then you, I kind of wonder, well, how come they're putting on the Imperial costumes? I thought they were filled with wires and metal and stuff, but no, it's just guys in suits, but you don't, you don't empathize with them. You, you dehumanize them because you don't see a single part of flesh. You don't see a single square inch of skin. It's just all completely covered like Darth Vader, until the momentous scene where he takes off his helmet. And you're like, oh, that's a dude in there. <laughs> He's a weird old man. <laughs> but, um, the, the last question I like to throw out for these episodes is, um, they're, all, they're all pretty across the board high quality. So my question is, how trippy is it? It's, it's the tripometer. Uh, zero not being trippy at all, five being super trippy, uh, decimal points accepted, uh, where would you place this on the uh, the tripometer? I would give it, um, did you say one to 10? Uh, 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 one to five. Actually, it did used to be one to 10. But uh, yeah, I, I think I'm keeping it one to five for the show. You should do like one to 7,508. That's not a bad idea. Uh, <laughs> one to five. <laughs> <laughs> I'd give it a solid four because it wasn't like um, surreal. You know, some of these shows get very surreal and there's issues of time travel or dimensions. This was just very mundane. Literally, it's just a guy on a dusty piece of ground. Uh, but it was more about the um, emotional aspects of it and the psychological ones and a little bit of um, theology thrown in and a little bit of ethics. But so that made it very accessible. You didn't have to kind of um, go on the sci-fi trip to really engage this episode. So I'd say four because of the, the issues it dealt with in terms of what is and is not a real relationship. And I actually had four was exactly what I had in mind as well, <laughs> which is interesting. I do find that uh, when I do these, uh, the guests and myself tend to be usually in the same place. I got one guy where I'm... Um, I always rate it like one decimal point below him. <laughs> like he's like 3.7 or like 3.6, right? <laughs> so it's kind of fun to work that out. Um, 
I got to tie a bow on this today because I, actually I have to go catch a train soon. But uh, Ken, I can see it on the screen because it's there. But could you tell people about your website if they want to get into uh, some more of your transhumanist and other ideas? Yes, thank you. And it's contextually relevant because I've written quite a few books reviewing movies. And so it's truefreethinker.com, all one word, truefreethinker. And that's it. Go there. It's user friendly. Okay. Well, Ken, thank you much for uh, joining in today. I, I think I have to let you do the, the outro with your reverb box there. Uh oh. <laughs> yes. And now we leave you from, I don't remember. I, I haven't watched the show enough to remember the taglines, but. And now we're going back into the Twilight Zone.